Hello and welcome to another lecture for my class, PSYC 770, Psychological Testing and Assessment. Um, as uh, is my habit, I'm beginning with a web comic. This is from phdcomics.com. It's a bit of an old comic, but it uh, describes a situation that's uh, familiar probably to most of us. Uh, these days, even though we're only a, a few weeks into the semester, already the desktop for my computer is starting to look cluttered and I'm almost embarrassed by the amount of items, links, etc. that are filling up my workspace. Probably you can relate because probably your computer, your desktop, your laptop, maybe even your tablet is starting to look the same way. Well, anyway, moving on. Uh, today's lecture is going to be called, or is called, Criterion Validity and Decision Theory, and as the name suggests, it's really an extension of the previous lecture, especially the part in the previous lecture where I talked about criterion validity in situations where uh, we are trying to compare a test, or the results of a test, to a particular, usually dichotomous outcome. And when we do that, there are some interesting calculations that we can make which allow us to evaluate the criterion validity of our test and also allow us to do some other interesting things. I'll talk about that a little bit in this lecture and in fact a little bit in the next lecture as well. So I already gave you a bit of an overview, but here's a bit more. Um, we're just going to focus on some uh, calculations like sensitivity and specificity, which you've almost certainly heard of before, uh, but which you may, like most people, may be a little bit confused about. These are complicated uh, concepts to uh, describe and to calculate. We're also going to talk about things like positive and negative predictive value, um, which are similar calculations, although somewhat different. And then we'll talk about how base rates of a, uh, of a phenomenon that you're trying to measure uh, can influence the interpretations you make when calculating things like sensitivity, specificity, positive and negative predictive value, and so on. So just to orient us uh, uh, once again, um, we're in situations where we're using tests uh, to make particular decisions. Now, this isn't all uses of tests. You know, sometimes we're trying with the test to merely measure some sort of um, outcome, which may be continuous. You know, someone's level of depression, someone's level of neuroticism, someone's level of creativity, and so on. But in other situations, we're trying to uh, may use the use a test, use the results of a test to make some sort of important decision. Like, does the person have depression? Yes or no. Is the person neurotic? Yes or no. Uh, and so on and so on. So let's use that example of trying to test for or trying to measure uh, for depression. You could imagine um, creating or, or finding a depression scale or depression test uh, that was relatively quick and easy to, to uh, administer um, and to score you know, a set of items. Uh, individual clients or participants uh, respond to each of those items. You add up the numbers associated with those responses and you get a, a value. If that value falls above a particular threshold or cut score, you say, okay, this person has depression. If it falls below a certain threshold, you say they don't have depression. Something similar, let's say, to the Hamilton Depression Scale or the Beck Depression Inventory or so on. Such a scale might be really useful because it would allow you to make a decision uh, about the presence or absence of depression in different people and it would be relatively quick and easy as compared to conducting a formal diagnostic interview where you sat down with each person, you asked them questions, you engaged, engaged in a bit of conversation and at the very end of that you compared their responses to the criteria in the DSM and said okay you know, this particular person meets criteria for depression, this other particular person does not. So we, we often are in situations, especially clinically, where we might want to use a test or might want to develop a test which would allow us to make decisions in a way that's a little bit quicker and a little bit easier than we would otherwise do using a slower and more kind of formal process of, in this case, diagnosis. So if we imagine our, our depression test or depression scale, you could think of a four square that could be filled out, could be kind of populated, depending on uh, people's true status, whether or not clients have a particular condition, you know, whether or not uh, an indiv individual client really is depressed, you know, if you were to go through and diagnose them formally, and the test result, you know, whether the test says they're depressed. And 
to connect this back to uh, criterion validity, let's just uh, allow that our diagnostic interviews are our gold standard, uh, are, or is a gold standard criterion. So the diagnostic interview gets it right all the time. That's the correct <coughs> version of reality. And in a sense, we just want to see how well does our test result, or how well do our test results map onto that reality. So we administer our, our test to a bunch of people, we conduct interviews with all those people, and then we just tally up the numbers of people who were depressed uh, based on test results and depressed in actual reality, you know, put them in you know, that number in box A. People who are uh, not depressed in reality, but were depressed in terms of their test results, put them in box B, and so on and so on. If you think about it this way, you can then calculate a, uh, a, or make a calculation called sensitivity, which is just the probability that the test result is positive given that the status, the true status of the person is positive. Um, which you could express like this, you know, probability test positive given status positive would just be equal to the number of people in cell A divided by the number of people in cell A plus cell C. So the, the proportion of the, those folks who um, have a positive test result, who the test says are depressed, who are in, you know, based on the total number of people who actually are depressed. We put this in slightly, uh, you know, a more complicated language. We might say that sensitivity is the likelihood that a test says someone has a condition when they really do, or you know, equi equivalently, the likelihood that the test picks up a condition or a disease, a disorder in someone who really has it. A similar calculation we could make is the calculation for specificity. Specificity is just the probability that the test says the person doesn't have a disorder given that they don't in fact have that disorder or condition. And if we want to represent this mathematically, we can just say probability test negative given status negative, and we can calculate a value for that by taking the number of people in cell D and dividing it by the number of people in cell D plus cell B. So of all the people who are truly status negative for the uh, disorder or the condition, how many of those people are also test negative for that status or, or for, that, um, for that disorder or condition? We want to express this in slightly more um, lengthy words uh, or language. We could say that specificity is the likelihood that a test says someone does not have the condition when they really do not have the condition. So let's find an example of sensitivity and specificity. Let's imagine that we have 500 people um, who are um, you know, being seen at a clinic that uh, tends to treat people with depression. And for each of those 500 people, we've administered our, our new screening instrument, our test. And for each of those 500 people, we've conducted a formal and, and high quality diagnostic interview that we're just gonna call the gold standard that just always gets right if the person has depression or doesn't have depression. Well, we could calculate the sensitivity of our test, which would be 90 over 100 or 0.9, so 90% uh, sensitivity. We could calculate the specificity of our test, which happens to be 240 over 240 plus 160, and that is 60 or 0 0.60 or 60% specificity. So those are our two calculations. And you know, of course, if you read um, literature uh, for clinical psychology and the, you know, they talk about different screening tools that are used to screen people into a study or whatnot, you'll often see references to, you know, the sensitivity of this test was, you know, 90% or 80 percent and that's what they're referring to um, if you just look at the you know the media you'll often see you know new tests for detecting breast cancer has you know 70 percent specificity what they're talking about there is just the um, probability that the test will uh, be positive given status positive for depression for breast cancer or for whatever else now, when we think about this a little bit further, we can, I, you know, it's often interesting to identify the types of errors that we can make uh, when we are um, doing this type of testing. So for instance, what are the situations in which the test 
and the true status of the person are not uh, consistent. Well, one of them obviously is a situation where the test says the person has a disorder or the condition or, or whatever, but in true reality they don't. And this is a false positive or if you think back to a stats class you've taken, you may be familiar with the phrase type 1 error. So type 1 error is, or false positive, is just situations in which the test status, or the test is positive but the status is negative. Um, and we could say this is a situation where we've uh, detected, it probably should be in like little air quotes, a condition that's not really there. Okay, well using that idea, the idea of a false positive, we can compute a false positive proportion. And the false positive proportion, using the numbers from our example, is the probability that the test is positive given that the status is negative. So that's B, cell B, that is, divided by cell B plus cell D. So if you want to just think about this, you know, focus on that column that I've highlighted here, the column that represents all the people for whom status is negative, and you ask the question, well, how many of those folks who really don't have depression or don't have breast cancer or don't have whatever, how many of those folks were tagged as having it by our test? That would be, by definition, the false positive proportion. So again, if we focus on that column on the right that I've highlighted, we can compute the false positive proportion, which happens to be 160 over 160 plus 240 or 0.40, 40%. And you may notice that that is 1 minus the specificity of the test. Just arithmetically that works out the same. Um, and this, you know, this makes sense if you really think about it. Well, you know, when it comes to negative cases or situations where the true status is negative, the person doesn't have the disorder, they don't have depression, they don't have cancer, whatever, you're either correctly identifying them, which is your negative test result, that's your specificity, you know, the, the status is negative and the test is negative, or you're incorrectly identifying them, their status is negative but the test is positive. So you know, a, a false positive proportion and specificity is are, are arithmetic inverses of one another. Now I said it's interesting to focus on errors. You know, one type of error is a situation of a false positive um, where, where test status is positive but actual, or test result is positive but actual status is negative. Now of course there's another type of error you could make that's a false negative, or if you think back to your stats class, a type 2 error. This is a situation in which status is positive, but test result is negative. So the, you know, the person in reality has the disorder, they have depression, they have cancer, whatever, but the test missed them. It didn't detect a condition that's really there. Well, you probably won't be surprised to know that you can compute a false negative proportion the proportion or the probability of test result negative given status positive, which is just going to be cell C divided by cell A plus cell C. And by the way, I'm flipping back and forth between the, the word proportion and the word probability, and that's not entirely sloppiness or laziness on my part. In this type of, um, in these types of calculation, we're, we're basing our thinking about probability in a tradition called the frequentist tradition of probability. It's just one way that mathematicians choose to think about probability, and that reckons probability as proportions over large sets of observations. So the proportion of, in this case, uh, people who have test result negative given status positive is likened to the probability of a person having uh, test result negative given status positive. And so if we think about that column on the left here, that highlighted column, this is the column of all the people who actually have the disorder, their, their true status is positive. We can compute this false negative proportion which happens to be 10%, as you can see. And if you're very careful, or if you're sort of following along, you know that that is 1 minus, or the additive inverse, of the sensitivity of the test. And again, this kind of makes sense if you really think about it. So if people 
really have the condition, they, among people who really have the disorder, they really have depression, they really have cancer, whatever, you're either going to be correctly identifying them, meaning your test result is positive among those people who are status positive, that's sensitivity, or you're going to be incorrectly identifying them, missing them. That's the situation where a test result is negative and um, of course true status is positive. So it just works out arithmetically that those things are additive inverses, but it kind of makes sense if you think about it. Again, we're just imagining among our entire sample just the people who are status positive and we're saying, well, our test is either catching them, getting a true positive, or it's missing them, a f true, or I'm sorry, a false negative. Okay, so we make a four square representing true status and test results, and we create calculations for sensitivity and specificity. Why do we do this? Well, it's useful for evaluating the diagnostic power or the diagnostic characteristics of our test. And often we are talking about tests which are used for diagnosis or for screening, so this is important. Now, fundamentally, sensitivity and specificity are asking questions about probability or likelihood of test result given true status. So if we already knew true status, how would the test result perform? If you're thinking about it carefully, you may be wondering, well, what about when we actually use the test? When we actually use the test, we're often more interested in knowing the likelihood of true status given test result. You know, if you are using an instrument like a Beck depression inventory or a Hamilton depression screen in a clinical setting, you don't know the person's true status. You want to know or you want to guess at their true status based on the results of their test. This is, again, something that we often practically speaking want to know, maybe especially in clinical settings when we're actually um, implementing or, or administering these types of tests. Well, you'll be happy, I hope, to know that there are some calculations we can make using the same basic setup uh, that answer this question of probability of status given test result. Remember, sensitivity and specificity are probabilities of test result given status. Now let's talk about some probabilities of status given test result. Now one of these calculations we can make is the positive predictive value. PPB. That's the probability of status positive given test result positive, which you could represent mathematically this way. Probability of status positive given test result positive, and if you had this type of a four square, you could make a numerical calculation by just putting A over A plus B. So here, instead of looking at columns, just try and focus on rows. So the row that I've highlighted here is the row of all people who have a positive test result. And you might well ask, among all those people who have positive test results, how many of them, what proportion of them, or by connection, what is the probability that they'll in fact have the real, uh, uh, have really have the disorder, they'll be status positive. If we want to put this in slightly different words, we could say that positive predictive value is the likelihood that someone has the condition when the test says that they do. And I think you can pretty easily imagine that this would be a useful thing to know. If I said that my test has a positive predictive value of 0.9, you know, 90%, you probably have a, you'd be more happy to use it probably in most clinical settings than if I said, gee, my test has a, only has a positive predictive value of 0.2. Not so good. And you'll probably not be too surprised to know that we can also make a calculation using the same basic setup called negative predictive value or NPV. That's the probability of status negative given test negative. And again, here we're just focusing on rows instead of columns. We're looking at the row for all the people who are test result negative, And we're saying among all those people, cell C and D, how many people are actually status negative? just cell D. So D divided by C plus D, that's a mathematical representation of the negative predictive value for our test. Or again, put a slightly different way or in slightly different wording, negative predictive value is the likelihood that someone um, does not have the condition or the disorder or whatever when the test says that they do not. So you administer the test to a particular person, it comes back that, you know, negative, you know, their score doesn't exceed whatever your cut point is, your diagnostic threshold, and you wonder, huh, test results negative, what's the probability that in actual reality this person is status negative?
So using our uh, same basic four square with our same 500 participants in our study, all of whom were given a, uh, a proper, um, you know, uh, gold standard diagnostic interview and also completed our screening uh, test or screening measure, we can compute the positive predictive value and the negative predictive value. A um, couple things to notice here. Um, earlier on when we talked about the sensitivity of this test, we said that this test had a 90% sensitivity and probably if you're like me, if you're like most people, that sounds really good. You think, oh, a test that's 90% sensitive, that must be a great test. It must catch all sorts of people who really have a disorder. Um, what you probably, the mistake that you were making if you had that, uh, that thought, and again, it's an easy thought to have, is that what you were really thinking about was positive predictive value. You were thinking that if the test result is positive, what's the um, probability that the status is actually positive? And using those same numbers, we can he see here that the positive predictive value of this test is quite a bit more modest than its sensitivity. It's not that the sensitivity calculation was wrong. It wasn't. It's just that people, I think, misunderstand what sensitivity means. And likewise, misunderstand what specificity means. They often are more interested, although they don't realize it, in positive predictive value and negative predictive value. Well, hopefully you're still with me and this is kind of making sense. And if it is, let's push forward and use our same basic setup to do some more calculations. You know, one of these is the false positive rate, which is the probability of status negative given test result positive, which you could calculate just like this, looking across that row for a test result positive, asking how many of those people are actually status negative or what proportion of them are status negative. Now we call it false positive rate and the word rate in that name isn't really very accurate because rates, as you may remember from your physics class back in high school or whatever, are calculations where time is in the denominator. So like you know, the speed your car is traveling is a rate because it's distance divided by time. We're using the word rate here just to make a simple distinction. False positive rate is false positives with respect to test result. And that's just to distinguish it from false positive proportion, which we already talked about, and that's false positives with respect to status. So the naming's a little bit clunky, but the basic idea here, especially if you just squint at the uh, equation, is that we're trying to figure out, we're trying to, to represent the number of people who are status negative among all of the people who are test result positive. So if we use the same basic setup and fill in our numbers, you know, our 500 people, the same as, same as before, we can make a calculation of false positive rate, which is 0.64, and we can make a calculation of positive predictive value, which happens to be 0.63, and if you just look at that really quickly, you can see obviously the one is the additive inverse of the other. And this again makes sense, you know, mathematically if you just look at it, but if you think about it for a moment, it makes sense, I think, on a more kind of conceptual or even intuitive level. We're just focusing here on the people who have positive test results. And when it comes to those folks, the folks with positive test results, our test is either correct, it's correctly identifying people who really have the disorder, or it's incorrectly identifying people who don't have the disorder correctly identifying people who really do have the disorder is the positive predictive value of the test, and incorrectly identifying people who don't have the disorder is false positives. You know, the test is saying they have the, the disorder or condition, but in true reality, they do not. So I just talked about false positive rate, and I bet you can imagine what's coming next. That's right, false negative rate, which is just the probability of status positive given test result negative. So if the test says you don't have the disorder, but you really do, that by definition is a false negative. The false negative rate is just calculated by looking at the numbers in that row, the row for all the people who had a negative test result, and asking among those people who had negative test results, how many folks really had the disorder, cell C, divided by the rest of the folk, or all of the folks, that is to say people in cell C plus cell D. So the false negative rate. And again, the word rate's a little bit incorrect here, but it's just to remind us that we're thinking with respect to test result. So again, if we take the data from our study and we look at that row that uh, corresponds to the people who have negative test results, we can compute 
a false negative rate. And we can also, if we want, compute and notice that that's the additive inverse of the negative predictive value. And again, if you see this on the screen, it makes sense probably just looking at the math. But if you really just think about it, um, we're just focusing on that row of people who have negative test results. So our negative test results can either uh, correspond to false negatives, that situations in which people really are status positive or true status positive, or they can correspond to correct negatives, uh, situations in which people are true status negative. So it's got to be one or the other, and these two calculations just reflect those two possibilities. So let's review a few important points here. Um, first off, sensitivity and specificity. These are calculations uh, of test results given status or given true status. And as I said before, they're interesting for evaluating the diagnostic power of the test. Uh, you may have stopped um, when you heard me say that before and thought, oh, power, that sounds kind of familiar. So if you've taken a statistics class, and of course I know many of you have, you may uh, recall that power in the context of null hypothesis significance testing is often defined as something like the probability of detecting an effect given that it exists. And we could try and express that in slightly different notation by saying something like probability of reject null hypothesis given null hypothesis is false or flipping it around, probability except alternate hypothesis, given that alternate hypothesis is true. Now I'm adopting this somewhat awkward notation, hopefully to create a comparison between power in the context of null hypothesis significance testing and sensitivity in the context of decision making, because we can express sensitivity as the probability uh, that the test is positive, given that the status is positive. So in some respects, when I say uh, sensitivity, specificity, or ways of thinking about diagnostic power, I am quite literally trying to make a comparison to the way we think about power in the context of testing, especially this type of testing and decision theory, and the way that we think about power in the context of null hypothesis significance testing. So just to repeat or maybe emphasize this point a little bit more, we can calculate sensitivity, we can calculate specificity, we can calculate false positive proportion, false negative proportion. These are all calculations of test results given status. And they're often interesting to us or, or useful to think about, especially when we're kind of considering the overall psychometric qualities of the tests, things like power and so on. We can also calculate positive predictive value, negative predictive value, false positive rate and false negative rate, these are all calculations of status given test results. And as I suggested earlier, uh, these type of calculations may be more interesting or, or maybe even just more useful in clinical work. Um, that may not always be the case, but in clinical work, we often want to know what is a particular person's status given the test results I have for that person. And, and fundamentally, that's a question of positive predictive value or similar calculations. So these types of calculations can be run one way, you know, you know status uh, given test, or they can be run another way, test given status. And it's not like one way is right or one way is wrong, but it is worth noting that they are often confused one for the other. And I think some of the confusion and, and the, the mistakes that people make when talking about qualities of a test are, go down to basic misunderstandings or, or substitutions of one of these calculations for another. So with a little bit of review and a little bit of practice, hopefully you'll understand them well enough that you won't make those type of mistakes, or at least you won't make them frequently. Well, the risk of complicating things even more, I want to introduce another idea which plays in or influences these types of calculations, and that is the idea of base rates. You've probably heard the, the phrase base rate before. It just refers to the portion of the population that has a condition, or equivalently, the prevalence. So we might say, well, what's the base rate of depression in the general population? Or what's the base rate of depression in outpatient clinical settings? Or the base rate of depression in inpatient clinical settings? These are always, these are all questions about how, how common or how frequently would we encounter that condition in that population. Now, if we want to use these same numbers that I talked about before, or that I've used before, to talk about base rates, it'd be pretty simple. We could just focus on the people who are true status positive and ask, 
what uh, portion of the overall population are those folks. So, you know, add up 90 plus 10, divide by 90 plus 160 plus 10 plus 240, and you get the sense that in this uh, population, or I should say in this sample, which we're imagining estimates the population, there's a 20% base rate for our condition depression. And I should say at this point, I just made up these numbers. So, <laughs> I mean, although 20% uh, base rate for depression is not entirely unreasonable, eh, depends on your timeline, but okay, sure. 20% base rate. You might well ask though, what if a base rate is different? Or what if we take a test that was developed in a population that has a particular base rate for depression or some other disorder, and then we try and apply that test to another population where the base rate is different? Well, here's where things get a little bit tricky because we think about sensitivity and specificity as properties of the test, you know, features or qualities of the test. And in a sense, they shouldn't change all that much as long as the test is used in similar settings and with similar populations. So if we, we develop a test in one outpatient population, maybe that's our population of interest. And so we, we gather a sample from that population and compute some psychometric properties for the test, you know, mean, standard deviation, sensitivity, specificity, whatever. It ought to be the case that um, if we take that test and move it to a new population, which is similar to our original population, that the sensitivity, specificity, and other qualities of the test shouldn't change all that much. But let's imagine that we take our test and we try to use it in two different settings. Now setting one is our, let's say our private practice where we see patients uh, and maybe 20% of them you know, typically have depression, so that's our, our base rate for depression in that population. And another setting is an outpatient clinic where the base rate for depression is somewhat higher. You know, they, they tend to attract more of those clients or they get more referrals or whatever. And just for the time being, let's assume that these settings uh, and, and the, you know, are sufficiently similar that they don't necessitate recalculation or of sensitivity and specificity. So we're kind of imagining that although they, though these are different settings, they're fundamentally the same, part of the same population, or at least so we suppose. They just do tend to have different base rates. So let's go ahead and just show uh, calculations for the base rate in the clinic. And here I've just created some data where the um, base rate uh, for depression, let's say in our clinic is 50%. And we can go ahead and calculate the sensitivity of the test in that setting and the specificity of the test in that setting. And if you've got a good memory or if you just flip back uh, quite a few slides, you'll see that the sensitivity and specificity are the same for the test in this new population. So the base rate for depression is different, but the sensitivity and specificity are the same. And, and you know, if we are, um, we've developed this test, maybe we're rather proud of it and we're sort of encouraging other people to use it. So we gather through the help of our colleagues data from this new setting, this outpatient clinic, and we say, aha, sensitivity and specificity are the same. Maybe this fills us with a sense of pride or a sense of hope. Our, our test is, is rather robust. It seems to work in different settings, even when the base rates are somewhat different. So we're, we're quite proud of that. Well, things are not always quite as easy as they seem. What if we look at the positive predictive value of the test? and the negative predictive value of the test. Now these values are actually a little bit different. And specifically, the positive predictive value goes up and the negative predictive value goes down when we take our test and move it to a setting where the base rate for our disorder is higher. So it, you know, to generalize from this point, we'd say when the base rate goes up, the ability of a test to correctly identify positive cases, true positives, that's the highlighted box in the upper left, that goes up. The positive predictive value goes up. Um, and the ability of the test to correctly identify negative cases goes down. So you can see in the bottom right, that 150 that goes in the numerator of negative predictive value, that's higher. So negative predictive value goes down. Here's our data again from our clinic, outpatient clinic setting. False positive rate, remember that's probability of 
a, f a false positive, status negative given test positive is 0.31. A false negative rate, which is status positive given test negative, goes to 1.14. And if you're paying attention, or if you flip back a few slides, you'll notice that the false positive rate goes down and the false negative rate goes up. So when the base rate goes up, when we transition the test from a setting where the base rate is uh, 0.20, 20% to a base rate uh, a setting where the base rate is 0.50%, 50%, the uh, false positive rate goes down and the false negative rate goes up. The test makes fewer false positives, but it makes more false negatives. So how can we make sense of this? Well, it's important to think about the base rates and to observe that when base rates are high, when we're in a setting or, uh, where it just is frequently the case that we encounter instances of whatever condition we're studying, you know, depression, suicide, binge eating disorder, whatever, in settings where the base rate is high, it's easy for a test to identify positive cases. So we're going to see more true positives and fewer false positives in a setting where there are just lots of those people. <laughs> but it's also harder to identify negative cases. So there'll be fewer true negatives and more false negatives in such a setting. And you can ask, well, is this a problem? And as is often the case, or as is, as is often the answer in psychology, it depends. It depends on what we're trying to identify and it depends on the consequences of identification. So thinking of a situation or setting in which the base rates of our disorder, depression, let's say, are rather high, um, the positive predictive value of our test is going to be pretty high. Um, so the true positive rate is going to be high. The false positive rate is going to be low. And that's probably pretty good, especially if false positives are costly. So if we want to avoid false positives, then this is pretty, it's pretty good to use a test in a high base rate place because we're going to have lots of true positives and relatively few false positives. What about negative test results? Well, the negative predictive value, which we could call the negative, the true negative rate is going to be low in this setting. Base rates are high. The false negative rate is going to be high and that may be bad, especially if missing cases false negatives is costly. So it really depends. Like you could imagine a situation in which mistakenly missing someone who really is depressed could be quite costly. A person could go on to perhaps hurt themselves or, or, or miss out on the possibility of getting better through treatment. So that could be problematic. The idea here is that when base rates are high, it's relatively easy to identify positive cases. It's relatively hard to identify negative cases. So when base rates are high, testing may not be necessary. Just diagnose everyone. You, you can imagine a situation in which you work at an outpatient clinic where almost everyone there is depressed. You don't really need a test to identify depressed people. Just diagnose everyone and you'll usually get it right. Um, unless false positives are really costly. Unless accidentally those one or two people who aren't really depressed and who you call depressed, unless that's costly for them, you know, they end up getting pushed into treatment that they don't want or don't need, then use a test and it will reduce false positives. What about situations where base rates are low? Well, in these situations, it's harder for the test to identify positive cases. And that means there are going to be fewer true positives and more false positives. It's also going to be easier for the test to identify negative cases. So there'll be more true negatives and fewer false negatives. This is when base rates are low. So what do positive test results mean? Well, the positive predictive value, uh, or we could equivalently call it the true positive rate is going to be low and the false positive rate is going to be high. And that could be bad, especially if mistakenly identifying cases, false positives, is costly because again the false positive rate in a low base rate environment low base rate setting is going to be relatively high what about negative test results 
Well, the negative predictive value, or we could equivalently call it the true negative rate, is going to be high. And false negative rate is going to be low. And that, that could be good unless, um, or especially if missing a case, a false negative is costly. So our false negative rate is going to be kind of low. And, and maybe that's a good thing because we want to avoid missing people. You know, maybe that's especially costly, like in our kind of previous example. When base rates are low, tests may not be useful. Just don't diagnose everyone. So you can imagine <clears throat> you work at a clinic that specializes, oh, I don't know, in, in the treatment of, of sleep disorders. And, and, you know, it's just rare that you find people who are depressed in that situation. And so you may not need to use a depression test. Just tell everyone that they're not depressed. You'll mostly be right because mostly they're not depressed. But you'll occasionally miss people. You'll have... Uh, false negatives. And if false negatives are costly, then you should use a test because it will reduce false negatives. You know, I'm, I'm sure someone who studies sleep disorders would tell me that depression tends to exacerbate sleep disorders or, or is, is um, you know, can be caused by sleep disorders. So maybe there, maybe testing is useful in those settings, but it's useful because it reduces false negatives. I guess the point that I'm trying to make here is that base rates influence the way we can use tests or the value of what a test can give us. And it's often about reducing false negatives or reducing false positives, which may be useful depending on what it is we're studying and the type of setting we're working in and the consequences of those types of mistakes. Maybe as, as a meta point, I would just say that testing helps us avoid mistakes, which we might want to do, especially if certain types of mistakes are particularly problematic. But our ability to avoid mistakes has at least something to do with the base rate for the thing we're trying to test for or diagnose for or screen for or so on. And we can see a kind of an interesting example of this if we think about suicide risk. Now, suicide risk is, is and, and suicide itself is, of course, something that really uh, disturbs us. I mean, it should disturb us. Many, some of us study it and all of us know people who study suicide, I think, at least in a in the class I'm teaching. Um, but suicide is something where the base rate's pretty low. I mean, I haven't checked this number recently, but it's like, last time I looked, it's like sort of 10 or 11 people out of 100,000 in any given year will uh, attempt suicide. However, the cost of a false negative on a screening test for suicide is very high. You could imagine you want to develop a suicide risk test that will identify people who are likely to attempt suicide. But the base rate for this disorder, this behavior, let's say, is really low. But the cost of missing someone, a false negative, is really high because maybe your test says that they are not a suicide risk, but in fact they are. And then they go on to attempt suicide and maybe hurt themselves or maybe even die. So you're motivated to develop a suicide risk test. And so you go out and you gather some data and you, uh, you know, have your test results and maybe um, you, because it's a very large data set or you follow these folks for a very long amount of time, you have some way of reckoning their true status. So within a particular time window, you know whether uh, for all of those people who actually attempted suicide and who did not. And of course, because you tested them all with your test, you know what their test result was for. You know, positive meaning suicide risk, negative meaning no suicide risk. And the base rate within this population, or well, within the population, but we're trying to estimate the population with the sample, we're estimating the base rate at about 0.005. And you can just see the simple math done right there. Um, by the way, uh, this base rate is still about 50 times higher <clears throat> than the general population base rate for a suicide. Uh, but I'm just kind of making it look, um, although it's rare, less rare, because I was running out of space in my PowerPoint. So the numbers are even smaller in samples from the real population. I had to make allowances for the limitations of my screen. So here we have the data from the previous slide. And what we're going to do is compute the sensitivity and the specificity of the test. And you could imagine if you were doing this research to develop this test, you might at this point be super excited because, wow, you have 95% sensitivity and specificity for your test. This sounds fantastic. And indeed, in some ways, it 
probably is, or at least in some settings, these types of numbers could be good. But I think this maybe provides a bit of an example of where if you misunderstand sensitivity and specificity just to mean like how good the test is, you might miss out on some other uh, more important points about how tests work, especially in situations or settings where the base rate for whatever you're measuring is rather low. To see how this works, let's take those same numbers and compute the positive predictive value. Again, that's the, uh, the probability that the person will be status positive, in this case suicidal, if the test says they are. And that's uh, pretty low, less than 1%. I'm sorry, less than 10%. The negative predictive value, that is the status, uh, the probability that they'll be status negative if the test says they're status negative, well that's really high. So you can see that the positive predictive value is very low, you know, it's less than a 1 in 10 chance of correctly identifying someone, and the negative predictive value is very, very high. Now if we take the same data and calculate the false positive rate. That's the uh, probability of status negative given test positive, false positive. It's 0.91. And if we calculate the false negative rate, probability of status positive given test negative, it's less than 0 0.000. It's a very, very small number. So again, we can see that what happens here is false positive rate is very, very high and false negative rate is very, very, very low. So what's going on here? We have a suicide test that seems to have great, or actually it doesn't seem to, it literally does have great sensitivity and great specificity, but we're trying to use it to test something which has, thankfully, a very low base rate. Suicide is a low base rate phenomenon. So we have necessarily poor ability to correctly identify positive cases. You know, the low positive predictive value means that we're not identifying very many, uh, correctly identifying many positive cases. There are few true positives. Um, uh, and there are also a lot of false positives. Among the positives that we're making, most of them are false positives because there's a high false positive rate. We have a great ability to identify negative cases. So the high negative predictive value, we are correctly identifying many negative cases. And we're not identifying very many false negatives. There are very few false negatives, low false negative rates. So most of the negative cases that we're identifying are true negatives. So was testing even worth it? The test seemed like it would be useful, at least if you kind of misunderstand what sensitivity and specificity mean, but it was really only good at identifying true negatives. And we already know that most people are not suicidal because we're in a low base rate uh, situation. Well, if we're trying to think of if testing's worth it, I think that the best way to proceed is to think about the mistakes. Think about the likelihood of mistakes. Um, Testing can reduce some mistakes. In this case, it probably reduced false negatives. Um, testing can increase others. In this case, it probably increased false positives. And by increase and decrease here, I'm talking about <clears throat> relative to not testing at all. That is to say, just treating everyone as if they were suicidal or more likely treating everyone as if they were non-suicidal. So one thing you can do when thinking about testing is think about the nature, or I'm sorry, think about the likelihood of the mistakes. Another thing is to think about the cost of the mistakes. So what's the cost of a false positive in this situation? Maybe a cost of a false positive is fairly low. So this suicide screening test says that the person's suicidal. In fact, they're not. But maybe all that means is they get referred for some additional evaluation. So, you know, it's not that big a deal because the subsequent evaluation finds that, no, no, this person probably is not at a suicide risk or, you know, they're not highly suicidal. So in this sense, if the cost of false positives is low, then suicide tests could be really useful. And we might say suicide tests are good screening tools. You know, they're good for screening people in. If you're working in a situation where there are other services that will work as a follow-up to this initial testing. But you could also imagine some situations in which the cost of false positives might be really high. Like maybe you're working in a setting where someone is tested and if they come up as positive for suicide risk, they'll be involuntarily committed. 
uh, without any follow-up testing. I mean, that may sound a bit extreme, but at least perhaps that could happen somewhere. In such a case, then, that's a high cost. You know, there could be people who are false positives who get committed for the night, for the weekend, for longer to care that they don't want or even need. Um, that would be bad. So if you were working in that type of situation, a suicide test where there were no follow-up evaluations provided could be bad. And you might say the suicide risk test is a bad decision tool. If it's the one and only test, it's a bad call because it's going to make a lot of false positives. And maybe, depending on the setting, false positive costs are high. So we can think about the costs of false positives. We can also think about the costs of false negatives. Perhaps the cost of false negatives is fairly low. So in this setting that we're imagining using the test, there are other opportunities for treatment. So even if the person is suicidal, but they're classified as not suicidal based on the results of our test, they'll still have other opportunities to be caught by the system and provided treatment. In that case, missing an at-risk person isn't that big a deal. But perhaps the cost of a false negative is very high. Maybe the setting in which we're working doesn't provide a lot of additional screening services or support uh, or treatment or intervention. So maybe uh, if the person misses out on, uh, you know, is classified as not suicidal, but in fact they are, then they're going to miss out on any treatment. And that would be a big deal. So if you've made it so far, congratulations, because I know this has been a long and at least in some places rather challenging lecture. Uh, let's do a bit of a summary. What are some important points? Well, in this last bit of the lecture, I've tried to stress that base rates influence the performance of tests. And by performance, I just mean the relative proportions of true positives versus false positives, true positives, or true negatives versus false negatives. And I also tried to illustrate by way of the example of a uh, suicide screening test that testing for low base rate phenomena is really tricky, uh, even with tests which seem in a sort of a shallow way of evaluating them to be really good, like they have high sensitivity and high specificity, we can still end up with situations in which we just frankly get a lot of false positives. Um, and, uh, and that can be potentially problematic. And you may well ask yourself, is this testing worth it, especially if we're testing for something which is rather rare, which has a low base rate? And my solution to that sort of vexing issue is, well, think about the types of errors that can occur, how likely they are, and then think about the costs of those errors. And really deciding whether or not to do a test doesn't just come down to cranking out some numbers. It comes down to thinking about those numbers and then trying to imagine uh, the costs and the context involved in the testing situation. And of course, that's always true. It's especially true, though, in situations that involve low base rate phenomena. So by way of a preview for next time, I'm going to be talking a little bit about brief clinical instruments, things like the SCL90R and the Beck Depression Inventory 2, you know, the BDI, which I've already mentioned before and which you're probably kind of familiar with already. Now, these examples that I've used in this lecture today are sort of uh, based on this idea of developing and using brief instruments to measure some sort of clinical phenomena, psychopathology or whatnot, and often with an eye towards making a decision. Does the person have depression? Do they not have depression? And so on. Now, implicit in all of this discussion so you know that I've done today is the idea that there's some threshold on a particular test which is useful for evaluating scores. So if a person's score falls above a particular threshold, then they're depressed or they're suicidal or whatever. And if it falls below, they're not. And you may well be wondering, well, where do these thresholds come from? How do you decide how high a score needs to be on a particular instrument to qualify for this, this shift in thinking that now we decide the person's a suicide risk or now we decide that they're a risk for uh, relapsing in their disorder? Well, there's a lot that goes into forming those thresholds, um, but one technique involves so-called rock curves or receiver operator characteristic curves. And I like talking about them because I think they're interesting and also because they give us um, an opportunity to use stuff we've talked about today, sensitivity and specificity, to understand how tests work when we give them different possible cut scores. So if we say, all right, set a cut score on a 10 point scale at five. What's the test look like? Now set it at six. What's it look like? Now set it at seven. And you can see, or you will see, how adjusting thresholds or cut scores yields different patterns of performance, which may be more or less desirable from one another.
Anyway, all that's coming next time. I think you'll find it interesting. I know I do. Uh, thanks for your patience with this lecture. I know it's been sort of long. I know it's been sort of challenging. If you have some time, you know, make yourself a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, have a snack, sit down, let all of this stuff sink in, and hopefully it'll make sense to you. If it doesn't, or if you have questions, please, please, please let me know. All right. Again, thanks for your attention.